First of all, welcome everybody. How's everybody doing today? Woo. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, this is the next, the latest installment of Arts at UNH. Um, today we have two writers and uh, novelists, uh, Wayne Harrison, poet Christopher Grillo. Um, definitely um, a very special reading being that both are uh, UNH um, uh, grads, uh, alumni, uh, Chris being recent, Wayne being not so recent, but not, <laughs> not too far away. <laughs> and so we thought it, I thought it would be good when Wayne sort of reached out and um, um, told us about his new work uh, to sort of pair him with Christopher. Um, what better way, you know, I thought. And then you get a poet and then a novelist. Um, and so we want to definitely welcome them to UNH, welcome them back. Um, it's very special because Chris was actually one of my first creative writing classes. So, I mean, when I first got here, so it's always good to see people sort of, you know, pursue what they're really passionate about and see, you know, see how they can make it happen. So very, very excited, very proud for Chris. All right, so what I'll do is I'm um, going to read each, each bio and then we'll have Christopher come up and then following Christopher Wayne to come up and then after that, uh, time permitting, we'll do a couple of question and answers, question and answers, and things like that, okay? <coughs> All right. So, <clears throat> Wayne Harrison's fiction has been featured on NPR's All Things Considered, the recipient of a Maytag Fellowship and an Oregon Literary Fellowship. He has published short stories in Best American Short Stories 2010, The Atlantic, Narrative Magazine, McSweeney's, Plowshares, Crazy Horse, Salon.com, the Sun, and other magazines. His stories have been notable in Best American 2009. You're actually reading Best American, right? Some essay, Best American Essays, right? There you go. We just missed you, but I think we're doing 2010. Um, and received special mention in Pushcart Prizes 2012. His debut novel, The Spark and the Drive, was published by St. Martin's Press in 2014. And his short story collection, Wrench, was a finalist for the Iowa Book Award the Serena McDonald Kennedy Award, and the Spokane Prize. A 1996 UNH alumnus, Wayne received his MFA from the Iowa's Writers' Workshop and teaches writing at Oregon State University. Christopher Eugene Grillo is an Italian-American writer and native of New Haven County, Connecticut. He feels a strong connection to his culture and his community, which he describes as humble and enduring qualities he works on to portray in his characters. Christopher is a graduate of UNH, where he plays strong safety for the Chargers and of Southern Connecticut State University's MFA program. At Southern, he studied under the tutelage of Vivian Shipley, whose narrative style has had a tremendous influence on his writing. And Vivian is one of my dearest friends, and he's right. She's a, a, a phenomenal poet. Her, her son actually teaches here, Todd Joko, so some of you may have actually had him at one time or another. Um, <coughs> Yeah, Christopher's uh, poetry and fiction has featured a pending in national magazines and anthologies, including Nastrax, Drunk Monkeys, Nocturne Review, Referential Magazine, and Indian, Indian Short Fiction. Christopher is a 2014 Best Indie Lit New England Award winner, uh, Nocturne Review's 2014 Poetry Prize runner-up. His first two collections, When Rain Feels the Chasm, and the six-fold radial symmetry of snow are set to release in spring of 2015 with Finishing Line Press and Zo Zoetic Press, respectively. Christopher is a language arts teacher in New Haven, but moonlights as a high school football coach. Let's welcome Christopher up here. Come on. Man. How we doing? This is fun. <laughs> um, I sat through many of these, sometimes not always willingly. I know you're not all aspiring writers, um, but you certainly all can get something out of this for sure. Um, I guess I didn't appreciate it maybe as much as I do now at the time, but this is a really cool thing um, that UNH does. So yeah, I'm Chris Grillo. I graduated in 2012. Um, Played football here. I was one of the. I was part of that first class that brought the program back in 2008. Um, 
And I guess most recently I'm a poet, though that is kind of like a strange thing to say out loud um, because for so long I think um, I associated identity with what someone does for a living. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's nice to be validated with a publication. Um, so my book is a, I wrote a book length collection of work for my graduate thesis. Um, and right away it started off as kind of a narrative. I wanted it to be uh, a narrative arc and, and follow you know, a story the way a novel would, but I wanted to do it in poems, um, which, made, which makes talking about poems individually kind of difficult because they don't all stand alone. Um, so what inevitably I did was um, cut them in half and, and publish them as two separate chapbooks. Uh, each chapbook focuses on the speaker's relationship with a different person. Um, the six-fold radial symmetry of snow is his relationship with his childhood buddy, um, Frankie, and when rain fills the chasm is his romantic relationship with Charlene. Um, so the first poem I'll read is from the Sixfold Radial Symmetry of Snow. It's called Naked, and it's um, about the locker room uh, after football practice. Um, <laughs> Frank, Frankie's kind of a bully. He's also a stud. He's going to do great things. He's going to be, you know, this tremendous football player, and he's going to get out of town and do all this stuff. But he doesn't ultimately. Um, and so this is kind of the reader's first sign that Frank has kind of a mean streak in him that's going to get him in some trouble down the road. So this is called Naked. Watch this, Frank says, holding court with the seniors in the gang shower. He pulls the tape from the melted ice bag strapped to his knee and dumps the freezing water over the private stall on bashful second string quarterback Steve Nichols. There's a yelp from behind the curtain and Frankie cackles. Steve appears more frustrated than usual. Today he took all of Frankie's practice reps while QB1 drank water and talked shit. What's worse, he knows he won't get any burn this Friday or any other. It's lonely Saturday mornings with the junior varsity for Steve. He stands, soaking wet boxer shorts dripping into his tong sandals. What are you hiding under there, Nichols? Frankie says and slaps a shampoo bottle at the sophomore's crotch. Young Steven, with balls like kettlebells, rears back and swings with all his might. He slips and barely catches Frankie on the chin. For a second, we are all stunned, and 17 running showers sound like rapids in the silence. But the awe is broken when Frankie retaliates, at first just once, knocking Nichols to the floor, and then again, holding his head up by his hair, and again, following through his cheekbone, and again, and again, till blood circles the shower room floor, pitched toward the drain in the center. All right, so the next piece kind of reflects the same phase, I guess, of the book, but it's on the Charlene side. And so I think Naked is, is kind of like it's the first time we see that Frankie's you know, has potential to be self-destructive. And on this end, the Charlene end, this poem is um, kind of the first chill that comes off of Charlene, who's the speaker's romantic interest, uh, the, the first chill that says that maybe she um, doesn't really love him the way he thinks she does. Um, I wanted it to be, genuinely, I started writing this poem, I wanted it to be a sex scene set to music, and I was gonna pump it full of innuendo, and it was gonna be great. Um, <laughs> but it didn't work out, it just wasn't working. So I was revising one day and I heard Otis Redding's I've Been Loving You For Too Long, if anybody knows the song, it's a great song. Um, and it kind of all clicked for me that this needs to be like a defining moment for the speaker. He needs to recognize that this is the beginning of the end for his uh, relationship. So it's called The Fade Out. With an ear flush to Charlene's chest, I hear our blood slow along the baseline, the single note that starts each measure and rattles loose change in this truck cab. The piano ascends each chord note by note, reaching the crest of the arpeggio before falling gracelessly. I press hard beneath her brow. Her nipple slips to the web of my fingers while the other hand fumbles for the clasp. The snare drum is frightening gunfire in perfect quarter notes. And Otis sings, you are tired and you want to be free. 
Charlene brushes my eyes closed, and for a moment I am fooled, wonderfully aimless, the scent of her skin overwhelming. But in the dark I realize I could be anyone, just a neck for her to cling to, an ear for her to bite, and all I hear, above our shortened breath, you are tired and your love has grown cold. Okay, I got all these notes on here like I'm gonna say any of this stuff. <laughs> um, this poem is the title poem for the Charlene series, the, that's, that chat book. It's called When Rain Fills the Chasm. And it's kind of a diff, like the most difficult poem to talk about out of context. Um, but it's really, it's like very indicative of the root conflict between the speaker and Charlene, and that's that they exist in different classes of society. There's a huge class division between them. Um, and it's something that in earlier poems is kind of explored in a funny way, and it's novel to each of them, and they're learning things about each other and trying to understand each other's worlds, but inevitably they grow up and it gets real, and it's not as fun anymore. And so Charlene's going off to college, and the speaker's kind of working a labor job, um, and they're still in contact. Um, but Charlene says something to him about rain, and it's going to stick with him because he's working in the rain right now, and he hates it, and he's gonna lie to her about it. So it's called When Rain Fills the Chasm. I bet that golden hair shines even fairer in the southern sun, but all Charlene can speak of is the rain. That rain's so few and far between, but when it comes, boy, you know it. She revels in its inconsistency, giddy outside her dormitory building, a country club for Yankee kids. They twirl one another in matching plaid pattern boots, plie and preppy summer dresses, wet, plastered to fresh burned skin. I've never known rain as anything but loveless. It has never sung me to sleep soft on my window pane. Mine is of a different brand. It marches on a nor'east wind, stings cold with the shards of the laborer's dreams it pummels. But still, I plead with our father, who art where those dark, foreboding clouds gather, for a chance to stand bare chest in rain, so that I might lie to her, collect tonight, tell her about today's storm, how beautiful it was, how it softened my hands. All right, so at some point, I realized that I needed to give Charlene a voice because she was being villainized. Um, and so there's like a series of poems where the speaker kind of mocks her and kind of um, makes her into a caricature, like a sorority girl. Um, and it's, it's his way of kind of understanding why she's not with him and why she doesn't understand him. Um, and he does that, that's like his fatal flaw. He tries to pin people down and fit them into his, in, in the molds of his world, you know. Um, and this is kind of her calling him on his shit and saying, you know, you have a role in, in the breakdown of this too, and you're not who you think you are, and I'm not as simple as you think I am. So it's called Charlene Speaks. I will not be within your art only, but make some of my own art just by being, to spite you, for trying to write me, a word on a line for you to put your finger on and tell your friends Charlene was this and Charlene was that. Instead, I'd like to speak for myself. You bore me. Your melodrama bores me, and it's just so hard to live up to your romanticism. So let this be a lesson. Some things are just too big for words, like when I walked in your life and ruffled your feathers. All right. Um, <coughs> This piece is what I would title the whole collection if I ever publish it as a full book length collection. Um, it's called Hero's Tunnel. And so Hero's Tunnel is the name of the bridge that goes over the Merritt Parkway if you're in between Hamden and Woodbridge. So yeah, it's cool. I never knew it until one day I'm driving by. It's like a little sign. So anyway, when you're coming uh, northbound, um, you come down the hill and you can see the, the tunnel there and you got northbound traffic, southbound traffic, and they're lit up at night, orange. And then the median comes out to a point, it looks like a little face. Um, so at this point, um, 
Frankie's lost all control. He's um, completely unraveling, and the speaker's trying to keep him together. But now the speaker doesn't really see the point. He's kind of conceding to Frankie's debauchery, and they're going to go and commit a crime. Um, and the crime in and of itself is kind of, it's kind of indicative of who they are because it's a, it's a tactless crime. They're going to pull a uh, copper pipe out of houses where they've worked in the summer. Um, <laughs> and it's, it, it's going to be a ton of work, and they're not going to make a ton of money, but it's like the line that they're willing to cross because they're still trying to retain like a shred of their innocence. Um, and so, yeah, stealing copper from Greenwich houses. Okay, Hero's Tunnel. It's winter, and work has run dry like radiator heat. Black ice spreads like ivy through paver decks and bleeds through the retaining walls I poured all year, find pockets of air in the mix and expands. It's cold, and the county is stark, and we are broke. But Frankie smiles. This is too easy. It's like we've cased these houses all summer. We forge for metal through Greenwich mansions where we've worked. The kind no one lives in, but the pool runs till November, and the grass and grounds are kept each week. I remember every front, date, every front gate code, which had guest homes with unlocked doors. But Frankie does the legwork, drives, and mans the saws off. On the way home, he never even toes the brake. He rides hard, head on a swivel for pigs, while I swaddle the copper in the back of the van. On the parkway, he hits 80 and never lets off the whip, pushing that lame horse down the last term, and two lanes are swallowed by autumn's postcard foliage. We spill out into nothing but concrete and glass. Stratford factory whistles sound beneath the bridge. Men with sleep-tired eyes pass men with smokestack eyes. Men like my father, who worked all night for less than a bucket's worth of our copper under a first shift hour that's not quite day, as the blackness of night fails and the sun stretches its rays, shades drawn, dressing in the dark by the dim glow of pawn shop signs. After the bridge, we can see the tunnel, aptly named for the weight it bears, two eyes shining orange in the pale morning, staring out at northbound traffic. We hit its light like a wave and Frankie drives faster. So there's a progression from um, that last poem that leads to this is the ultimate poem. And um, they kind of steal their copper and they take off. They're going to go down south and have a vacation. Um, but along the way, they're going to stop at Charlene's College and crash a party. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a last ditch effort for the speaker to make a play at Charlene. Um, and he's got this thing built up in his head of what it's going to be like. and it's not going to end well. Um, but so as much as it's kind of tragic, at the same time, there's, there's this like element of um, recognition that the speaker is going to recognize that um, maybe the reason that him and Frank can be so loyal and unconditional for each other is because they understand why each other acts unfavorably when they do. And maybe that Charlene can understand um, that element of him because she is so different. Um, so it's, in a lot of ways, it's kind of hopeful that maybe someday he'll get that unconditional, intense relationship that he wants, but now he realizes he's, he's, he realizes he kind of has to uh, meet someone halfway, maybe. And so that's kind of what I see from him. But it's called Party Favors, and it's pretty funny. Um, I knew she didn't want me there, but somewhere along the line, after two half pints of Seagram's and through the endless nothing of inland towns along the southern interstate marked by intermittent trailer parks, I convinced myself, maybe in a dream, dazing in and out of drunkenness, that she'd see my car and run down the front steps, leap into my arms and we'd kiss hard, Carolina's sun beaming over us, casting one shadow on the cobblestone. But it wasn't so. And when we got there, Charlene wasn't even home. We waited by the keg or at least close enough so that Frank could sneak long drinks from the tap without anyone seeing. Eventually, she arrived, fashionably late, to her own party. I watched her walk through the door, shifted in the crowd to make myself visible, standing on my toes, neck crane to the limit. She smiled awkwardly and mingled on. Fuck it, Frank said and raised the tap over his head, letting beer fall like a cascade into his mouth. Let's get out of here. Fuck it, I agreed, but I wouldn't go easy. It was like Charlene had forgotten we were coming, or that she invited us, at least indirectly. Frank reminded her, barking at frat boys, 
clearing me a path from the cold tub to our car with the keg on my back. I loaded it into the trunk while he held the line, ten of them each looking to the next to make a move while Frankie swore and spat like a coyote. Nice block, I said, and we drove off into the dark, further down, deeper south. All right. I have, like, I have two that aren't from the, uh, from the book. Um, one, this one here won a uh, Noctua Prize, and it's just like a giant metaphor for writing, I think, uh, through the veil of masonry. I worked um, for a mason for a while. I got kind of schooled in uh, which stones, you know, broke easier than others, and which ones needed more material, and uh, you know how consistent your um, thin set needed to be, and stuff like that. And it got me thinking about craft and writing, and um, the kinds of subjects writers are weary to take on. And um, I think at its core, it's kind of like angsty. Um, and it's kind of my angst about the world telling me that trying to uh, write poems is impractical. Um, <laughs> so that's what this is about. It's called On Writing. We worked in bluestone, a malleable rock that Tony said was menopausal. Hot to the touch, even in fall summer months, March and April, and like ice when the heat broke and the rains came. Lime was indifferent, stubborn really, flaking and breaking under the rubber mallet, and brickwork was damn tedious with its formula, its pattern like paint by numbers. It was August and dry as hell, so I added water and lost the mix. Forget your tools, Tony said, slamming his trowel against the side of the wheelbarrow, dry rot flecks exploding off the rim, the whole rig waning on one flat tire. Let the material work for you. Easy for him to say all paver decks and less ambitious stone. I cursed and leaned against the rock stack behind me, letting my neck fall and squinting into the sun, eyelashes like little prison bars, and then a bite at the back of my arm. I jumped up. Tony laughed as if he willed my arm burned himself. I hated his precision, his straight cuts and quarter inches. The best artisans were bent and twisted like wrought iron, but we both stood straight. Tony with his chalk strick and his pressed, his pressed collar, and me still wet behind the ears, strong as a bull, able, and sane. He knew the wall would wear and split regardless, that our grout lines would crack and our stone move under heavy snow. But building strong walls took time, cost money. And Tony knew better than anyone the first rule of masonry, give the people what they want, curb appeal. All right, this is the last one I'll read. Um, this just got into an anthology, which is exciting. Um, it's not in any of the books, and I, I published it in a strange little magazine a while back. Um, but it's called On the Beach with Josephine, the Tuesday Before She Will Die. And it's about, indirectly, it's about my grandmother who had like a very degenerative death um, while struggling with uh, Alzheimer's. And it's kind of the last moments, um, the last like vivid um, moments where she was very kind of cognizant of what was going on. And I took some liberties with it and made it into this kind of comment on the size of a life and like what um, what kind of impact does a life really have? And so I think the speaker starts off kind of um, defeated about how this person is gonna you know fade away, but then there's sort of um, sort of a kind of hopefulness where he realizes that the life itself isn't overshadowed by you know how someone dies, even if that death is very small and weak and futile. So. On the beach with Josephine the Tuesday before she will die. It is twilight. Josephine drinks wine while I skip rocks and sift sand through my fingers to find the flattest stones. Because words elude her, words of comfort or acceptance, of faith or regret, we make small talk, speaking matter-of-factly of June and its dry heat. Josephine smiles, half drunk, and stares out at the sound. The water reflects a muted purple sky that sits on the surface in pieces like petals of a prom corsage. Morning is still, the sun gentle, but the white of Josephine's gown, the walls, 
Her gurney bedsheets and discharge papers weigh on my eyelids, dull my vision, this sunset. It seems endless, Josephine nearly shouts, the most vital I've seen her this month, the one the doctor said would be her last. But her next words fall aimlessly from her mouth. Where does heaven begin, Jean? Jean is dead, I say. Reaching back, I heave a smooth stone I'm saving. My balance shifts, I corkscrew to the sand. I know well-skipped rocks continue on out of sight as if bouncing along forever, at which point I imagine they sink. From my knees, I watch the ocean swallow the rock, refined by years, raked through hot sands, most of us dare not walk with bare feet, fighting all the while to resist the undertow. Thank you. Thank you uh, for coming out tonight, today. Um, I can't believe when I started here, most of you weren't even born. <laughs> Crazy. I was going to talk about like uh, stuff that happened when I was here, like you know, Kurt Cobain killed himself and uh, O.J. Simpson and uh, all that. But yeah. Cobain, who's that? <laughs> Tanya Harding, remember that? Um, but I, I, I apologize. I don't have a great voice today. I've been getting over this, uh, whatever I have. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to read. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Randall, for having me out. This is really fantastic to be here again. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. So um, this is from a novel. And... Um, it's always uh, kind of tricky to read from a novel without knowing everything that happened prior to the events. Um, but basically what I think you should know is that uh, the, the narrator is uh, Justin Bailey. He's 18 years old. He's an auto mechanic. I was an auto mechanic for a while. Uh, his boss and mentor is a legendary hot rod mechanic and his name is uh, Nick Campbell. He's the best in New England. Uh, Nick and his wife Mary Ann uh, lost their infant son to SIDS uh, one year ago, and last but not least, Justin and Marianne have been having an affair uh, behind Nick's back. So this happens right behind, right after uh, Nick and uh, Justin and, and Marianne had sex for the first time. And this is at a place called Holy Land USA. I don't know if any, everyone's ever been there, but it was a big part of my, <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, uh, part of my experience. But uh, if if you've been there, you know what I mean. <clears throat> Where Marianne brought me it looked like the day after the apocalypse. Sections of concrete parking lot juttered up like broken ice on a pond, and rusted and peeling chain link fence opened on many temples that had been caved in or knocked apart. It was the remnants of a Waterbury oddity called Holy Land USA. I'd read that in the 60s, 100,000 people every year made the pilgrimage here, some from overseas. Its name had even issued from the Pope's holy mouth. I forget why. But now it was just a bizarre road warrior vision of the Bible. Crosses were covered with spray paint. Nearly every statue decapitated. The Ark of the Covenant lay half charred and upside down under the archway for Eden. According to the Waterbury Republican, the park was a haven for junkies and gangbangers. And I noticed for the first time the cluster of lowriders parked on the opposite side of the lot. Marianne led me around fire pits and rain puckered porn magazines. Past the broken cinder block wall of a former gift shop, guys with black bandanas were spray, spray painting crowns over the Ten Commandment tablets. They weren't bullies, but the murderous badasses that bullies modeled themselves on. Relaxed among the wreckage, they seemed to arise from lawless places, one of them baseballing rocks out into the biblical city with a stick. They were Latin kings, and according to the paper, they left bodies in this very park. They called each other angels with the unsettling implication that they weren't afraid to die. I avoided eye contact and smiled at nothing. Though I couldn't think of a single word, I strained to give the impression that Marianne and I were deep in conversation, and also that I was the last person who would ever report a crime. Someone laughed and I couldn't swallow. When her, with her olive complexion, Marianne could have passed for Puerto Rican, 
and I saw the danger that holding her hand and being white might put me in. I was afraid enough to let go, but I didn't let go. In my periphery, I saw one of the kings stop moving, then a voice full of gravel, yo, and in a black Yankees cap, he glided up on us. He was squinting so hard, one eye was almost closed, as if aiming a gun, only the gun would come up sideways. They pointed them sideways to break convention, or to say, this is my hand too, this gun is my hand, and you're so close I can't miss. As easily as I can slap you, I will shoot you. Hold up, he said. You know about Buicks? I got an 80 Regal, it does his shit like ting, 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 like castanets, you know? My brown, and khaki, my brown and khaki shop uniform. It got me into bars and liquor stores, and now it was saving my life. I looked at Mary Ann, who was waiting for me to speak. I think he means pinging, she said. I found my voice and asked what kind of gas he used. High test only, he said. And I was stunned by both his somberness and the understanding that this outlaw, this soldier of the street, according to the paper, used the same grade of gasoline as the CEOs who brought us their muscle cars. With a slight dip of his head, a faint bow of respect, he asked if I could take a look. I allowed myself to smile when I was walking behind him, giddy with a resurgence of faith in my profession. Automobiles were like a great species among us more vital and abiding than most people in our lives, yet only a handful of us understood their complicated language. Even gangbangers were humbled by the ailments of their cars. The radiator was low on coolant, and I showed him a leak at the thermostat housing. From out of a pack of Newports, he handed me a joint, and though I'd never tried pot, I thanked him, as if he tipped me an ordinary currency. Marianne led me along a path that must have been a lawn at one time, Though what grew now grew out of magazines, cigarette packs, McDonald's wrappers, broken glass, plastic bags. The weeds looked mutated, they were so big. And there were briar bushes and poison ivy and tamarack trees that didn't know where they were. Flying a ripped flannel shirt like a flag, the leaves yellowing underneath. Other limbs broken by a tire, a rusted tricycle. And the crawling and flitting bugs didn't know where they were either. Ho hovering down to a rose petal that was really a torn Doritos bag. There was a stucco table with stucco benches in a clearing where gravel and concrete kept the plant life down. You can imagine a family having lunch here years ago, but now half the table had been broken off, its rusted chicken wire skeleton showing underneath. When I lifted a damp newspaper off the bench on my side, two fiery centipedes came to life and I knocked them away. Last Thanksgiving, there were guys in army jackets up here, she said, Vietnam vets. They had a fire and the turkey cooking on a spit. It snowed, remember? She looked around as she described the flock buildings, the vets using the park for cover in a snowball fight. And it occurred to me that Thanksgiving was only days after their baby Joey died. I looked around through her eyes of mourning, imagining a kind of comfort she'd found in all the wreckage. The marijuana joint was carefully rolled into a funnel shape. The wide end was twisted into a fuse and the narrow end had a small tube of cardboard wrapped inside to keep the contents dry from saliva, I assumed. I turned it lightly in my fingers, appreciating the street skill of criminals. I gave her the joint and she lit it with my lighter, and like the song said, she smiled before she let it go. I'd never actually watched someone smoke, and when her eyes softened and glassed over with almost sexual delight, I let go of four years of prejudice in a second or two. Her eyes were lighter than I'd realized, gold-flecked with the early afternoon sun, under eyebrows that were thick and exotic foreign, though she was half Klamath Indian and more American than I was. Her nose wasn't wide and flat like a girl I knew who said she was a Cherokee, but thin and straight-edged and delicate. But it was her eyes first and the close, unselfish way she watched you. That's not bad, she said. She hit from the joint again, and I tried it when she offered. <clears throat> I gave it back and waited to see what happened. Across from us, the real photograph of Jesus Christ was sun-faded and shellacked with grime but the Hitler mustache was, uh, and swastika earrings stood out in throbbing gold. At the top of the hill behind Marianne were three crosses, white in the sun. Jesus hung on the middle one, his body missing from the waist down, and for the time I had an odd sense of piety up here. Marianne smiled easily, the pot working the way it's supposed to. You can ask me anything, she said. I promise to tell the truth. If you want me to pretend nothing happened, I will. I said, is that what you think I want? I don't know. I'm not sure what Nick means to you anymore. I know what he means to you, she said, and if you want me to pretend nothing happened, I will. 
I nodded cautiously. Her look was soft and didn't challenge me to say anything, but long seconds passed when I was afraid to speak. She scraped moss from the rutted tabletop with a flake of stucco. You can never predict how you'll be, she said. After we lost Joey, my sister came out. She was with me every minute for a week, but Nick went back to work, back to his cars. He should have had people around him and he had machines. She looked up at me and sighed. I know, Ray and Bobby and all his minions. <clears throat> I don't mean them. I mean real people. And I'm sorry to sound cruel. I should have closed the shop, but that's the only part I blame myself for. I said I'd give it a year, but what's it costing? We don't touch anymore. We don't talk. If you ask me what he wants from his life, I honestly couldn't tell you. The man I've lived with for seven years. As she said this, her voice drew taut and at times was tearful. And the sudden wash of emotion both stunned me and made me feel close to her. I put my hand over hers. Words seemed weak now, and there was nothing I needed to know. So that's what he means to me, Justin. Less and less, she said. Okay, I'm going um, to skip forward. That was a scene with Justin and um, Marianne. This is a scene with Justin and Nick. Um, <clears throat> so Nick, again, is this genius mechanic. And he's gotten his hands. Um, hang on a sec. <clears throat> Sorry. He's gotten his hands on this um, remarkable car. It's a Corvette that they made only two of. Uh, 1969, and it was the fastest car ever. <laughs> like, I mean, it was space age. It was so amazing. And anyway, Nick has got his hands on this car, and Justin and Nick have been uh, racing the car at a, at a strip that uh, Justin knew about from when he was in high school. Eight or nine cars were on the edge of the strip, a few more lined up in the field. We were waved to, and I heard my name called like a stadium chant, Bailey. In a few weeks, Nick and I had gone from being nobodies to being the home team. Fireflies pulsed in the corn, and Hank Williams Jr. sang about getting whiskey bent and hell bound. It was the first time there were girls, and the rich exhaust and cooked tire smells were interrupted by the occasional perfume of tan bodies passing by with cigarettes. The Chevelle was a 70 with black SS stripes, five spoke alloys, and a collar induction hood. I couldn't believe the owner was sitting on the lacquer fender, a tall redhead standing between his legs. He was talking to a guy who wasn't very selective, who had even hung out with me a few times in the smoking area. When we got out of the Corvette, the owner of the Chevelle bounded over to us with his handout, Dwayne Papps from Torrington. He had a big handshake and sculpted arms that had to be the product of workout rooms with 45-pound plates and wall mirrors. He wore carpenter pants and a flannel shirt with the sleeves cut off, but he smelled like he was fresh out of the shower. Wrap your ass in fiberglass, he said, walking around the Corvette. You got a big rat motor in that beast? No, don't tell me, don't tell me. Keep it like poker. Maybe it's just a tuned up mouse, I don't need to know. I couldn't tell if the guy was on something. His bright teeth kept flashing, and he had these long dimples pleating his cheeks. I can do a grand, he said to Nick. You feel like doing a grand? I started over to conference with Nick, as we'd done before, to compare our vibes on the guy in private. But before I'd taken a full step toward him, Nick said, sure. And Pat's, Paps grinned and clapped his hands. The shit was on. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry. It was agreed that Paps and Nick would race alone, and when they walked over to the start line to give Mots their money, the redhead stood there by herself. The other girls didn't talk to her. She looked like a city girl, smoking her designer cigarette, with one arm wrap, wrapped around in front of her short biker jacket. I said hi and could tell she appreciated it. But then I was called over to the keg where I was handed a cup of foamy beer and someone asked when I was going to try a run in my Nova and somebody yelled my name and I forgot all about keeping the redhead company. It was like these guys had been my friends all along, only I'd misunderstood them. It was my own fault, all the surrendering. Who could respect that? They wanted to see Paps lose. What the fuck did he need a grand for? It turned out his family were the ones who brewed the blue ribbon beer. And in a few minutes, I was with Valerie Wilson, who I'd pined for more fanatically than all the other top-tier girls in my class. Valerie had once written our, name in, our names in a heart on the chalkboard in one of the ag buildings. And for two days, I tried to be where she was in the halls. Before I found out that the Justin she meant was a 23-year-old house framer, I approached her in the cafeteria line, where she stood with two of her friends, big-haired, untouchable girls like herself. 
and I chickened out so that all that happened, thank God, was a moment of awkward silence before I turned and heard behind me, okay, and a girl's heart was sarcasm. How's Waterbury, Valerie said now. I never go there, unfortunately. It sounds like heaven compared to here. She gave a bleak glance at the fields, and in the same grim spirit, she took my cigarette and brought it to that mouth that had never smiled at me before, leaving a lipstick print and giving it back so that when I smoked it, I was almost kissing her. And I had the impulse to put the filter in my pocket, as I certainly would have done in high school. You know what I'm so sick of, she said, everything all wet with dew, stinking like bonfire and either sweating or freezing your ass off. Like in 20 years, I'm going to wake up in the same freaking shithole. The only bar I've even ever been in is a fireside. She reached down to slap a mosquito on her calf. That's the same as here without getting eaten alive. Showtime, Paps called from the road, and he and Nick got in their cars. You think Nick can beat him, she said. We'll see, I said. I don't know what he's running. A 454. My sister used to be friends with his sister. I nodded. It'll be close. L6 or something, she said. I looked at her. LS6? Yeah, that's it. Jesus. I started to get up to tell Nick that he needed to race hard, but then I hesitated. Maybe it was too late to run over there. Maybe Nick would hear when Paps did a hole shot to clean the tires how little RPM was needed to break them loose, and he'd know. Or maybe I just didn't want maybe I just wanted to see Nick finally lose. I can't say. I sat back down. But after the race, when Paps got out of his car at the far end of the strip and the guys who'd called the finish came up around him, and I could hear yelling, but not what was yelled. I was on my feet, running all out, regretting that I let him race alone. A quarter mile is a hell of a run when you're fired up, and by the time I got there, I could only manage a fast panning walk, my lungs on fire. The son of a bitch is running nitrous, Paps was saying. What's out there that can beat an LS6? He don't have to show it, he don't want to, Burke said. Why can't he just open the hood, make me a liar? The guys around him, more had come from where they'd watched the race halfway down were shaking their heads and looking away, as if they'd already made their points. Paps looked at Nick. The fuck you hiding, man? Nick, couldn't, uh, Nick could have looked around and seen he had friends, but instead, he stared at the pavement for a few seconds, and then he said, Held with it, hell with it, and went back to the Corvette. He opened the hood, and Paps came around the other side of the car. <clears throat> uh, Paps ran back to his Chevelle and came with a flashlight. He searched the fuel and coolant lines, looking for a nitrous hose. The fuck is that, he said. What kind of race car engine you got in there? He touched the screen over the carburetor throat. No blowers and no nitrous is the only rules, Burke said. Mots came over finally with the money, and Paps went up to him and said, Here, give it back, just mine, instigating a shoving match. The guy, three guys flew on Paps, and more ran over. There was a shotgun suddenly, held by a guy I didn't know. He pumped it, and a live shell flew out of the ejection port and hit me in the knee. But that was the height of everything. In a few minutes, Paps got in his car and ran a hole shot that lasted almost the entire quarter mile, and he skidded to a sideways stop near the woman who ran to the passenger door as if wolves were chasing her. Everyone was laughing and calling out, and the guy with the gun blasted orange thunder at the sky once before they told him to cut the shit, asshole. He was going to piss off Wickersham. I could still smell the shotgun blast as Nick eased onto 62, and I didn't trust myself to swallow, certain that even my own saliva could make me puke. He's either a cokehead trying to be a redneck or the other way around, Nick said. If he knew how to handle an LS6, it could have been interesting. I remembered running to save his life. There were needles still in my lungs from having run so hard. And I couldn't understand why we didn't have full honesty between us. If only I could have predicted his reaction when I told him about Mary Ann. If only I knew him the way I wanted to. With six or seven country miles to go and riding with a man for whom the rumble of exhaust was more satisfying than any radio station, I breathed and tried to empty my mind. She's a good-looking gal, he said. Who? The one you were talking to. I just knew her from school, I said, and the small loosening I'd been able to accomplish tightened back. When I was your age, it was all hippie girls, he said. They won't ever let you be quiet. They want to know where you're coming from all the time. All the dope going around was supposed to open you up, I guess. I'd live for moments like these when something about my company allowed Nick to talk freely. But now I couldn't fully listen for thinking about Valerie Wilson. Without her here, without her firelit sandy hair and her poison perfume and her interest in me, I wondered what the hell I'd been doing. Given the opportunity, could I have betrayed Marianne? But man, you should have been around back then, Nick said. It was the pinnacle of everything, right? 
That's the word. I'm 13 when GTOs kick off the whole era. Then the Mustangs, Camaro, Chevelles. Super Cobra jets are rolling off the lot when I'm your age. Hemis, LS6s. If the EPA never cracked down, we'd be living in a different world right now. How'd you meet Marianne? He closed his mouth and laughed to, him, laughed to himself. She was broke down. She had this meat grinder Bel Air 348 with a Rochester. I mean, it had to be all the way gone through. She wants kids, I said. She deserves kids, but I can't. I got the operation. My pulse started the race. I wasn't going to act surprised. Then why don't you get divorced? I braced for him to slam the brakes, but instead he began to nod. Is she ready to? How should I know? It was a reflex answer, but after a second, it was the only question I had for him. You know about us, Nick. Cut me loose. Tell me you know. But his face stayed calm as he turned to look at me. You two were friends, he said, following the road without watching. Headlights approached fast. Are you asking if you should get divorced? Watch the road. The car passed with the sound of a small explosion. She should, he said, and I leaned over. We were doing 70. She should want to. It's 30 coming up, I said. A station wagon appeared, and Nick passed it with a swerve out and back over the solid line, so fast the guy might have thought he'd imagined us. Then on a dotted line straightaway, he took on two cars with, all, with about 30 feet between them and a towering four-wheel drive in the oncoming lane. I had no voice. Even the cars we were passing held down their horns, and the pickup we were about to hit head-on wailed what sounded like a semi-horn, and I was suddenly not a part of this, removed, by some kind of merciful disengagement I guess you're allowed right before you die. I saw the tread pattern of the big truck's left tire as we veered back. The pain was in my fingers, both my hands buried under the seat into the springs, and then a big pulse and nothing when I let go. I squashed my hands between my thighs as two miles flecked past, and then he let off the gas, and at the same time he cut the wheel all the way. Another car would have rolled, but like a free-falling cat, its belly stayed on the road. And we turned a, streaming one, a screaming 180 in the shoulderless uh, lane, all the fluid in my body letting go of gravity as he slammed second gear, baking the tires to cushion the momentum swing. The car could have done it forever, fishtailing across the lanes until the gas was gone or the rubber melted off. But we didn't have forever, because for all his flawless instinct of steering and acceleration, Nick couldn't see into the future, couldn't save us if a car appeared on the next rise. I yelled his name, but only after it was too late to do anything. We rocketed over that rise in the wrong lane, and he let off the gas and shifted. <clears throat> For the next few miles, we drove only 20 or so over the limit, and I took stock of my body, all the pounding happening inside it, trying to ease, 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 and keep the breath going in and out and not cry. Nick turned on to a dead end shaped like a thermometer. He killed the engine and unwedged his cigarettes from under the emergency brake handle. The minute that followed comes in strobe light flashes. My feet are touching the ground and the knowledge I'm still alive and will keep living chills my lungs. I'm crawling on the road, picking a rusted sheet metal screw from my palm. On my feet again, I can feel the howl in my throat. A dog barks. At the glassless windows of the outbuilding, I'm knocking out window, uh, win wooden sashes with my bare hands. They're probably calling the cops, Nick says. I kick until something heavy falls over inside. The Corvette starts. I walk behind a construction site, cut across a back lawn. And then he walks over, I'm gonna skim up here. Uh, he walks over to where he's parked his car at the Arco station. Um, it was strange that my door was locked. I'd been waiting a long time to be somebody whose car you didn't fuck with. And I'd left my door unlocked on purpose. When I went in the glove box for emergency cigarettes, I'd smoke my pack on the walk. I found, folded in half on top of the registration papers, a stack of hundred-hour bills. Nick had locked my doors. I sat back and opened the bills in my lap, five of them, half the money we'd won. I put down my window, either to tell him I didn't want it or to thank him, I wasn't sure. Drab yellow in the cone of streetlight, he smoked sedately. Why don't you love her anymore? I said. The cigarette dropped out of his fingers, and from where I was I could smell the carpet burn. I ran around and hopped in the other side, broke the orange head to ash on the passenger floor. Nick faced me with the steering wheel as his pillow, staring not at the gray mess on the carpet, which he seemed unaware of, or at me, but out through my window. His eyes were wide, his mouth open, in a look of fear. 
This was after, he said. Should, should I stop? Is this, am I going too long? Okay, I, I didn't realize how long. Should I keep going? Okay, gotcha. Um, this was after, he said, his head never moving as if someone were holding it like that against the steering wheel. A couple days after we lost Joey, he said, we didn't leave the house. It was, we couldn't even change clothes. Her sister was coming the next day. There was a bottle of wine in the pantry we opened. We sat at the table and it all let up. It was like he was just upstairs again. How he used to make this one sound. You'd think here comes his first word, he pulling all his breath and then flop. Just that, flop, every time. A low hum rose in his throat and twice without heat, he pounded his head against the top of the steering wheel. We get in the shower together, he said. We need one bad, it's been days. We wash our hair, we get each other washed, and the water, I'm holding her, and I know what can fix us. It won't be so bad together, another baby. We can take care of him and be happy and live, a new baby. He can sleep with us always, I don't care, just keep him in the bed, keep him safe. I take her in the bedroom, we're hugging, we're on the bed, then she's, she stops kissing me, but we have to, we have to. She stops. She says, stop. She says, don't. But I do. I don't stop when she says. With a soft choking sound, Nick closes his eyes. She's like she's dead under me. We have to, Marianne. We have to. Don't cry, please. He sniffed deeply and swallowed. And then she's laying there, not moving. She won't say if she's OK. She's staring at the door. What did I do? Jesus, God. I pull the blanket over her. I go out in the garage and stay there all night. In the morning, I hear her calling for me. She comes in the garage and is calling for me. She has to get her sister at the airport. She can't see me behind the boxes. That was all he said, and I looked away when I was sure he was finished. I felt sore and tingling. I entered a brief fantasy of being there that night so I could pull him off her. He slumped in the seat, his hands turned over on his thighs, a finger twitching in toward his palm. He stared through the windshield, though the thing he was seeing that was making him look afraid wasn't outside. He was still in their bedroom with what he'd done. When I realized I could have forgiven him, I pushed myself out of the car. I walked away with the sensation of emptying out and then refilling with hot electric life. I started to run across the lot and then on the sidewalk. I was free of him, free of caring about him, and the shaking inside from before came back, and with it the cold steel conviction that I never wanted to die or change. Thank you. Let's give Wayne and uh, Chris another round of applause. Yay. All right, thank you guys for hanging in there with us. Um, I definitely want to get a couple of questions in before we sort of, if you guys got a little time, like five, Oh, we got time. Yeah. Okay. So, Catalina, you can. Are you gonna? You you going to class, right? What? Our class. Yeah. Okay. So I was just gonna say, if you if you want to leave a little earlier, you can tell everybody I'm coming at night and we'll stay. Okay, Latanya. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on how, like, after you graduated from uni, how did you get your work out there? Um, you talk about like sending out publication. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. So I think when you're when you're in the MFAs, you get a little more guidance on it than you might at like an undergraduate creative writing. But there's definitely like levels of publications, um, and you know you just gotta send out like yeah, you can go up. Uh, poets and writers will have lists of um, uh, journals. Uh, there's a ton of submission bombers on Facebook. It's the greatest thing for a new writer in the world. They'll tell you exactly where to submit, and um, you submit in like groups of lots of people. And you just gotta keep sending though. Like people are very discouraged about rejections, I think. Um, and you, you just gotta get thick skin and just send, you know, all the time. Just keep sending. I always equated to the first. The first, as a little kid, the first learn, word you probably learned was no. So it shouldn't be foreign to you. Right? <laughs> I totally agree. Is that is, is that is that um, 
Does that answer it? Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to know like, like what yeah. venues to send to or mm -hmm. like what the process is like after you graduate and yeah, all yeah, that lonely journey, journey and stuff? <laughs> For me, it was kind of weird because I, um, I was a criminal justice I want to ask you too, that's, you know, I, I, well, that's my question was yeah. getting right here. What was your minor and then how did you transition to, I don't know if you realize our workshop is, you know, pretty good, pretty it's, decent it's, MFA program. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's one of the top MFA programs in the country. So how did you sort of transition from CJ to our writer's workshop? That's, yeah. the, that's a more interesting question for me. Sure. Were, were yeah. you here when Jeff Green was here? I, 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 yeah. Jeff, 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 Jeff. Okay. He was, uh, um, you probably have his old job. <laughs> he was, uh, he was uh, a creative writing teacher here. And, um, is he in Europe now? Yeah, he's in France. Uh, and, uh, I've, I've never met him. Oh, he's great. Yeah, I've him email. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, we got to be good buddies. And I visit him out there in France uh, before and stuff. But he, uh, you know, I took a creative writing class thinking it was going to be a blow off class and it was going to be easy. And it wasn't. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, uh he, so, you know, I said, I love this, I love this, what can I do? And I hadn't read anything. I mean, I, you know, I'd been a mechanic after high school and stuff, and it was a really different journey for me. I, I don't think I read a serious book till I was maybe 25. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I asked him, what can I do? And he said, you know, apply to MFA programs. And he gave me a big list, and you should apply to 10 or 15 of them, and it's very expensive to do. Um, and Iowa accepted me on the first try, and when I got there, um, it was it was crazy. It was you like oh man, into. there were people in there that already had books out, and they yeah, were in the yeah. New Yorker and stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, ZZ Packer was there and stuff. Were, you know. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was it was a very uh, humbling uh, experience, and I got kind of burned out, and I didn't didn't really want to write after I got out of there. Um, but it really is. It's just persistence, and it's uh, you know I would I, the only thing I'd add to that is. Um, so many magazines now, it seems like, take uh, online submissions, and I would totally do that because it's a lot cheaper and it's, uh, you don't have to go to the post office and stuff. And, and you just send them out and forget about them. You know, just, just get on to something else, you know, and then you might get that surprise, um, you know, email. The, the Atlantic story I had, that was out of the slush pile. Really? I just, you know, everyone was saying that, uh, oh, they're never going to read out of the slush pile. I was like, all right, well, I'm going to send them this story. And, you know, I got an email from uh, Michael Cunningham, and uh, it was pretty life changing. But, um, yeah, it's just persistence, and you know, and, and then and the good thing about publishing in, in magazines is that you will, uh, you know, hopefully get an agent that way, and then your agent will tell you don't write stories anymore, write novels. So everything you learned, everything you learned in your MFA program, pretty much doesn't matter anymore because they don't really talk about novels. Uh, so it's it's. Uh, That's a good answer. Published in, uh, yeah, that's. But it know. does happen. I mean, I right. Think those are right that's right, yeah. But yeah. fiction writers, prose writers, but not so much prose. That's uh, yeah. that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, one more question, then we have to sort of get on. But does anyone have any, any last question that they want to ask? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my question is for you. How did you get that idea to just, like, turn, like, I guess, write a novel? I was where did that inspiration come from? Well, my expression desire is to be a novel. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't. I have trouble leaving. Like if I sit down and start writing, I can't leave and revisit and like pick up where I left off. So it was just it was just a way for me to like consolidate the story. And as I keep as I'm writing more and more, like I look back at that. I, I mean, this probably was for any already. Whatever's up in your book is like the worst writing you've ever done. That's how I look at it. Yeah. So now, um, I mean, I'm writing so much more concisely than I ever have, and it's even. It's like consolidating even more. Like I started messing around with meter and stuff, and I'm actually I'm turning into like this like crazy. Poetry. See, this is scary. But, uh, I had him for a student, and he's doing meter, man. No, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, but I was um, yeah. I just I wanted I wanted to write a story. Like I had a story in my mind, and that's it. Just a lot of kids in the program they started writing for their thesis, and they didn't know what their thesis was going to be about. Because you do have to have some sort of like overarching theme at the end. So a lot of people just kind of tie it together loosely, but mine was actually was very consistent from the beginning. I knew what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest thing when you go to MFA programs. I advise people nowadays. Is you have to know, even the master's programs, you have to know what you're trying to do. You don't want to waste your money, uh, spend two years and trying to figure it out. You know, I mean, with the MFA especially, because it's sort of a specialty degree and it's sort of, you know, uh, Depends on what you want to do with it too. Right. I mean, you can detest you and you teach an MFA program, right? 
Yeah, in Oregon State, right? So um, a, a lot of times you may have writers coming just for the craft of writing, some right. for the craft of writing and wanting to teach. Right. So it's, it depends on which. And we always pop that bubble really quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's pretty impossible to get in. If I mean, God, we just had a position open and there were like almost 900 applicants for one job. Oh, right. no, you yeah. know, but yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy. crazy. Yeah, so. That's another whole other story. But anyway, thank everybody for coming out. Um, thank our writers again. Audience.